In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, the wise men have departed, or in our case, perhaps packed up into their box for next year. Those of you who have the pre-lit trees that you can zip up and put in the attic, we're done with it rather quickly. The rest of us who have been struggling to keep half-dead trees alive through Epiphany will be gathering up needles under the sofa until sometime into Lent, if not Easter. But oh, wasn't it glorious. And last Sunday, the Epiphany start to this season of Epiphanies was spectacular with a great attendance and beautiful music and hymns and Father Mike's sermon, which just was splendid and got us started out on this journey so very well. I think it's just amazing to think of those wise men, not necessarily three as we were told, but Who knows, number three for their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Thinking of them as the magi, the magoi, perhaps Zoroastrian priest from Persia, from Iran, or maybe even primitive astrophysicist, who knows. My takeaway from some of that is that This event of the birth of Christ was bringing together people of so many different cultures that the world could never have imagined it before. The Zoroastrian priest, or the priest descended from Aaron, or even the old pagans who worshipped the very stars that the Magi followed, all coming together in a single group bound together by the love and wonder of this child who who was born. Other cultures worshipped the celestial bodies, but these Persians, like their Hebrew friends, worshipped a God who created the sun and the moon and the stars. And so we hear that the whole world is now coming together as we read in the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation from every family, language, people, and nation, a kingdom of priests to serve our God. That's pretty spectacular. If I were a smart ad man, I would try to find some way to distill that big verse from Revelation. Maybe it would sound something like, all are welcomed, all are valued, all are loved. (laughs) I think that would look pretty good on a t-shirt. What do you think? Every year on the first Sunday after the Epiphany, we start at the Jordan River. If you listened carefully to both of the hymns we've sung this morning, they both tell the whole story of Epiphany. All of these manifestations, the baptism, the descending dove, the changing of water into wine, the miraculous healings that we will hear about on the way, and finally on the last Sunday in Epiphany before Lent begins and the bishop is here to confirm ten or so adults we will hear of the story of the transfiguration, Jesus going up onto the mountaintop with Peter, James, and John. The whole story is before us. But today, we stand on the banks once again of the Jordan River, just as we did on the first Sunday in Lent. And Luke, just as he began the infancy narrative that we heard on Christmas Eve, puts this within the context of history. When Jesus was born, we remember, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. But if we back up in Luke just a bit before we heard the gospel this morning, we will be reminded that this baptism of Jesus, the beginning of his public ministry, began during the 15th reign of Tiberius Caesar, reminding us that the oppressive arm of the Roman Empire is still very present, controlling every aspect of the lives of the children of Israel, our Hebrew brothers and sisters. And then we're told that the more local government is controlled by Herod and his brother Philip, the Tetrarch. Um, These are not real descendants of David sitting on the throne, but pretenders, puppets of the Roman Empire. And they're guilty of all sorts of atrocities, serial monogamy, and even incest. John the Baptist had a few words to say to them about their misbehavior, and it cost him his head. 
And then we hear that all of this is also happening while Pontius Pilate is the governor. So even at the baptism of Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, we see the shadow of the cross cast upon the waters. This Pontius Pilate, who knew that Jesus was innocent, but because he feared the mob, he washed his hands and turned his back on the whole affair. The world that Jesus lived in during this time, the world that John the Baptist lived in, the world that all of their people lived in, was a dispirited place. All of the institutions were broken and corrupt. The prevailing attitude was malaise and despair. And even the religious leaders were not people that were much looked up to. The Pharisees were those who wanted to keep the rules and keep their power, but the less influence they had on the people, the more they turned up the heat on the rules. Rules, nothing but rules. The Sadducees were um, enamored with wealth and ritual and prestige. The Zealots were, well, they were enamored with winning no matter what the cost. And then there were the Essenes that we talked about a few weeks ago who simply despaired of all religious structures and wanted to withdraw, turn their back on the Herodian temple, withdraw into the wilderness and live spiritual lives. No more concern with all of the hierarchies, but sort of a fresh start, starting over. What's interesting is that Jesus, rather than identifying with any one of these groups, drew disciples from all of them. He had disciples among the Pharisees. We remember Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea who gave the tomb in which he was buried. And of course, a young man named Saul from Tarsus. Perhaps Judas Iscariot was among the Zealots. And certainly John the Baptist among the Essenes. All of these groups come together under the mantle of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus into the river is an enigma, isn't it? Um, He comes down into the water and John says, Oh, how you the sinless when I should be baptized by you. And Jesus said, No, let it be. Let it be so for now to fulfill all righteousness. We think of um, the water baptizing us, cleansing us from sin, but in many ways, Jesus goes into the water to baptize the water, to make it holy, to cleanse this Jordan River, this symbol of his own people. And he also stands in solidarity with all of the brokenness of everyone who comes down into that water. In the early history of our own country, Some of our fellow citizens also, like our ancient Israeli brothers and sisters, felt the burden of oppression, having been brought to this country against their will and in chains and in servitude. And the earliest baptismal liturgies in the African-American community display such beauty. And in some Baptist traditions, we still see something of this today as people enter on one side of the water and those on the other side call back and forth in a chant, an antiphonal chant back and forth. I'm tired and I'm burdened. And the chant on the other side, cross on over, over to the other side. Can we imagine for a moment what it would have felt like to enter into that cold water and to feel it ease the marks of the wounds on our backs and to stand in amazement to see that the Jesus standing there with us also has stripes, the marks of the whip and a crown upon his head and the wounds in his hand. And to all who go down into that water in that day and subsequently the questions are put to us, do you believe in God the Father Almighty, the Father who speaks from heaven? Do you believe in the Son who stands in the water with us? And do you believe in the Holy Spirit who comes to indwell your heart forever? Those are the questions that would be asked this day were we to have baptisms, but they're good questions to be reminded of on this 
feast of the baptism of our Lord. We can imagine our baptisms. We can imagine going down into that water once again. And as we do so, we can ask, what are our fears? What are our shame? What is our shame? We can imagine standing in that strong current. Have you ever done that in the river when the current is trying to push you over? Dig in your toes a little, brace your legs so that you can continue to stand. And as we stand in that water of baptism to feel the cool on our backs and the current taking down the stream, all of those things that we wish to leave behind. Lord, I'm tired and I'm burdened. And the voice from across the Jordan says, come on over to the other side. And we listen for that voice from heaven, that voice that Jesus heard, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And because Jesus has heard that voice, we too now hear, these are my beloved children with whom I am well pleased. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.